Okay. Um, all right. Uh, the sound is back on. There's a giant mute button here that people keep kicking on accident. So uh, I never noticed it. Um, so the last video didn't have audio. Hopefully this one will. Uh, so let's see where we, this is lecture 17. We uh, just finished a unit on NP completeness on a conditional theory of hardness. So we're now in the last unit. There's five lectures left. This is the sort of the hodgepodge uh, stuff. This is the stuff uh, that's, we didn't really know where to put it. Um, like, uh, but it's important that you know it. So it just kind of all goes at the end. It's not necessarily hard, but it is diverse in the topic. It's not like a nice contained unit. Today's topic is going to be called the Maxwell Min Cut Theorem. I have traditionally presented the Maxwell Min Cut Theorem in, gra in the graphs unit, but uh, it's moved to the end of the semester this year because uh, it's related to something we'll do next time called LP, linear programming, uh, and the LP duality theorem. So it's, it's actually a special case of what's called linear programming which is algorithms involving systems of linear equations, in inequalities. Uh, but the max flow min cut theorem is actually just one thing, which is uh, about graphs. So a flow network is, it looks like this. You have some start S and some uh, terminating T, and you have a bunch of nodes. And uh, you have a, hopefully, acyclic, but not necessarily true graph such that there's a bunch of there's a bunch of arrows uh, going from S and into T. It can contain a cycle, um, but uh, depending on who you ask, S should contain no incoming arrows and T should become contain no outgoing arrows. Uh, so those are the only two nodes that are guaranteed that you have this guarantee. Uh, S can, you can solve the problem if they do have incoming and outgoing, but we'll greatly simplify the problems for you and just suppose that S has no incoming and T has no outgoing. You're concerned with, let's talk, we'll, we'll talk about two problems today and then talk about the relation. A max flow in, a gr in, a, in, a fl in what's called a flow network, a flow network is a special kind of graph. Um, with each edge is associated two numbers. So if you have u uh, and v, you have two numbers, two positive numbers, and they can be real numbers associated with it. You have a flow, uh, which is f u v, and then you have a capacity, c of u v. So with each edge is associated the flow and the capacity. The capacity is given to you, and you are to determine the flow. So uh, think of the flow as a literal width of a road, and you're trying to send something through the network from S as a starting point and to T as an ending point. You can think of a flow network as something that models traffic, where you have a, a wide road, and that's the number of lanes in the road. Maybe the capacity is the number of cars that can be moved per hour. Maybe uh, the capacity is the number of barrels of oil that can be transmitted per hour. Maybe it's the bottleneck or something, you know? So uh, given a flow network like this, you want to send, you want to, you want to, given a flow network and capacity values on the edges, which again are positive, you're concerned with how many, uh, what is the maximum flow that you can transmit in the graph? Um, and already we can see because of the diversity of graphs and the way they constrain problems, we, we're running into some things. Let's just put some numbers on here. Let's say this says uh, capacity two, this is capacity three, this has capacity five, let's say this is capacity three, and let's say this is capacity one, one, something like this, okay? So uh, analogously what this would mean is like there's a three lane highway going out of Atlanta, but then you have to take the one lane highway uh, out, right? So uh, what is the maximum flow? And let's just only consider those two paths. Let's forget the middle ones for now. What is the maximum flow that you can send out of S and into T? So what, uh, another property that's important is that its flow is conserved. So let's say you have, um, if you send two cars down this road or two units of something, the flow, you must send two units out of it. What that means is like you can't, none of the trucks can park at that specific, stop, they have to keep going through. So let's say you did, uh, you send two trucks north. Now what that means, when we write it like that, we mean the flow of, of the capacity, right? This is an edge we would call saturated. It's saturated because it's full in some sense. You're at the maximum capacity. Now, where can you send those two trucks? They have to go somewhere. This node needs to have conservation. What that means is you, can ha you have to send the two somewhere, so you send two out of it. 
Now, notice already that we have a bottleneck kind of thing going on. Um, this road is of width two. This road is of width five. But the only way to reach this node of this road of width, width five is through the road of width two. It doesn't matter that this road is of width five because you can only send two down it anyway, right? So two bottlenecks the width five road. Now you could fix that if there was somehow another way you could send more cars into this, but uh, you can't given the graph that we've done. Now these two have to go somewhere. Uh, well, let's just send them down here, right? Now let's say you try to send, uh, okay, you, you tell three trucks to go down here, uh, but there's a problem. You can only send one truck down this road. So this uh, failed. So you can only send one truck down this road. And again, we have a, sa a similar bottle bottleneck issue. Now notice that how many trucks did we send from S to T? We were able to send three uh, trucks. And th another way to double check that your flow is correct is the fact that the outgoing of S must be equal to the incoming of T. No truck got lost and wandered. And look at that, two plus one is equal to two plus one. So sort of an elementary example. Uh, the constraints uh, of this problem can be worded as this. Each, each uh, capacity is positive. Um, the flow uh, is also positive and uh, must be strictly less than or equal to the capacity. You can't have more flow than capacity. And that there's a conservation of flow. So for all vertices V and V, that the sum of the outgoing of U must be equal to the sum of the incoming of u. Something like this. What we really mean is like if you have, let's say you have incoming two, four, one, then you have to have outgoing, the, the sum of two, four, one, which is seven. So you have to have three, four outgoing, something like this, right? Whatever comes in has to go out. So the sum of the incoming has to equal the sum of the outgoing. So here, this would be u. In this, in this example. So given a flow network, we're concerned with algorithms uh, that will find the maximum flow in the graph, right? Any questions on just the definition of a flow network before we get into how to solve it? It's not an obvious problem because uh, if the graph contains cycles, you know, maybe you can, maybe this road had width 10. Maybe you could have sent another one down that road and then he has to take a detour and jump over here or something like that, right? So. Finding the maximum flow is not obvious in a, in a graph, right? Any questions just on the definition of a flow on a, in a flow network? Many problems can be modeled as a max flow problem. That seems surprising. And maybe we'll do some applications of it at, at the end. Um, right. Um, so let's do an actual graph and try and find the maximum flow in it. Uh, We'll do the following graph. So let's take a second and see if you can find the maximum flow in this graph. Uh, what is the maximum number of trucks or units or whatever that you can send uh, through this uh, graph? Let's take a second to see if we can try and uh, work it out on pen and paper. So uh, we'll immediately we need, to n we need to notice something, okay? The source and the, and the destination are important. The source can only send a maximum of three plus five plus four, which is 12. So whatever the flow is has to be less than 12, right? Simply because that's three plus five plus four, that's 12, right? We know we can't send more than 12 units, so we're already bottlenecked there. Um, what other bottlenecks do we have? Well, notice that T can only receive no more than five plus seven. I mean, five plus two, which is seven. So we know that the flow actually is also less than seven. So seven is less than 12. 
So we know that the flow must be less than seven. So let's try and find um, a flow that, uh, that can send seven things through this, right? Uh, here's one, you send, uh, let's say you send two here, you send two here, and you send two here. Uh, then you're going to send four here. You're going to send four here, and you're going to send four here. Now that is a flow of six. Do we agree? You just take the top highway, you take the bottom highway. Can we find a flow of seven? Yeah. Yeah. You send that one guy on that one road that's really sketchy, and it's going to go. He's going to go there. He's going to meet his buddies, but then he has to go down this way because the road's not big enough. And then you're going to do not four, but four plus one, which is five, right? This node has incoming four, but now it has incoming one. So the outgoing flow must be equal to the incoming flow. So we see that four plus one is five. So you send five here, then five here as well. Well, that's a flow of seven. How do we know that's the maximum flow? We know that's the maximum flow because the T can't receive more than seven. So we found a flow of seven, and we know the T can't receive more of seven. So we know that the flow must be less than or equal to 7, and we found a flow of 7, so we know that's the maximum flow. Do we agree? Now, this was an easy example where we could kind of look at S and T and just be like, well, I guess that's why it's a maximum. We want just not to find the maximum flow, but we want to be able to prove that's maximum. We want to be able to have some sort of certificate of authenticity that says, like, I couldn't find a greater flow. Not that I couldn't find a greater flow, but there is no greater flow. That's Maximum, you know, we didn't really spend a lot of time proving correctness of algorithms. We rather just sort of relied on the intuition. But we would hope that an algorithm that pr that solves the max flow problem should um, come should provably give us an output which is maximum, right? So let's sort of generalize the idea that we did from S to T. And we noticed that the outgoing of S was the incoming of T and so on, right? Any questions so far about why that was maximum? We're going to go a little slow, right? So if you think about it, what we did really when we, could, when we considered the outgoing of S and the incoming of T, and we, we just sort of, we did a cut in the graph. So a cut in the graph of the flow network is uh, written as cut of L comma R, such that uh, L is a subset of uh, V, uh, R is equal to the other, the opposite, V minus, uh, v minus uh, L, and that um, S is an L, uh, T is an R. So L and R mean left and right. When you cut the graph, you consider the sum of the outgoing edges minus the sum of the incoming edges as, as the flow on them. So like um, when we did the cut of S, we did, we did A, uh, B, uh, C, right? What we really did was um, we drew a dotted line over the graph, right? And the cut is the sum of the outgoing edges minus the sum of the flows on the outgoing edges uh, minus the incoming edges. So for example, this cut told us that there was uh, three, five, and four, right? So the cut is the sum of the outgoing edges minus the sum of the incoming edges. Hopefully, if you do a cut, and you do a good cut, it should not contain any incoming edges if it's a good cut. But some graphs, of course, contain cycles. And if you cut, the, if you cut that cycle, you can't avoid an incoming edge, right? Otherwise, th it wouldn't be a cycle. So that's a, an example of a cut. Um, and notice that when we did T, we did a different cut, right? So that cut was uh, size 7. So this cut of L comma R is equal to uh, 5 plus 4 is 12. This cut was equal to 7. Do 
we agree? So a cut in the graph is a partition of the vertices such that what is the, the, the flow over the cut, right? And, and it, they can't be empty. S must be in one and R must be in the other. Intuitively, you can think of it as you literally take the picture of the flow network and you chop it. You literally draw the dotted line through it and then you count the edges that cross. Um, but the dotted line is allowed to be squiggly and go around things, you know? So uh, the question remains, uh, what is the smallest cut possible? So forget the flow problem for now. Let's just study the cut problem and then we'll relate the two together, right? Uh, the, if the flow network is, if the, if, the, if the max flow problem is trying to maximize the amount of things you can send to the front, uh, the minimum cut problem, yes? If it was impossible to not, so like you're saying there's a back edge, then you would subtract that. Yeah, the flow is the uh, outgoing minus the incoming. Now, it, it, hopefully, if there's a backwards edge, you will have that edge with flow zero because you don't want to send anything backwards, hopefully. Now, in a complicated way, you could saturate a cycle by sending trucks to stay in an infinite loop forever. Something like that's allowed but hopefully not, right? But you would, count the, you would have to count the backwards edge as part of, uh, part of the cut. And again, it's the flow on it and not the capacity, not the capacity, right? Um, uh, right, so maximum flow problem, you're trying to maximize the amount of things you can send. The minimum cut problem is as if you're like the, the bad guy, you're the villain, and you're trying to figure out what is the fewest things I need to do, the fewest resources I need to spend to separate S from T. And this is a very practical problem. There's like a, a, Jeff Erickson's book has an example of like a map of the Soviet Union that, that was made by America and it contains supply, supply line routes uh, from deep into the Soviet Union into, the, into what would be like a Western front line or something. So you could think of uh, uh, finding the minimum cut problem the min, the min cut problem is like how many bombs do I need to drop to separate S from T? And let's say that if there is an edge that has capacity five, I need to drop five bombs on that road to destroy each lane of the highway. Four bombs is not sufficient. I need to cut the, uh, the flow, I need to cut that flow, right? So the min cut problem is like if I give the graph and I karate chop it, what is, this, what is the smallest cut I can find in the, in the graph, right? So given this graph, what's the smallest cut we can find? Um, well, I could go through between A and D, and then I could go between B and D, and then I could go between S and C, right? And that would give me a cut of two plus one plus four is seven, okay? But there's also another cut of D to T, and then E to T, so I could cut only T, and that would give me a cut of also seven. What if I went around T, and I did two plus one plus one plus four? That's going to be eight, so that's not even a smaller cut. Um, so the smallest cut that we can seem to find is seven. But how do we certify, uh, let's find it, if we're looking for an algorithm to find the max flow, we were able to kind of argue uh, why the flow was maximum. We, can we argue that, this, that the cut is minimal? The smallest cut we can find is seven. I can't find a smaller one, but how do we know that's the smallest cut? And again, you're allowed to do some crazy things. It's defined as a set partition. It's not defined as a literal line through the graph. It's independent of the way you draw the picture. So you could technically go around D, go between C and E, and then go back up and then cut through B and then come back down, something weird like that. That, that would be allowed. Um, well, it turns out that the maximum cut and the minimum, uh, the maximum, excuse me, the maximum flow and the minimum cut problem are related. In fact, they're identical. So the max flow min cut theorem is basically says that the max flow is equal to the minimum cut. That's the max flow min cut theorem. So we can certify uh, if, a, if a flow is maximum by finding a minimal cut. If we find a flow that equals the cut, then we know that that's the maximal flow and also we know that that's the minimal cut. We'll prove the, the max flow min cut theorem and the max flow min cut theorem will, will be used as what's called the ford fulkerson algorithm. The ford fulkerson algorithm will solve the max flow problem for us. But because the max flow equals the min cut, it'll also solve the min cut problem for us, right? Uh, practically, what this means is the, the possible flows are gonna be seven, eight, 10, 11, something like this. These will be your flows. 
and then your possible cuts are going to look like 11, 13, 18, uh, 19, something like this. So these are the f these are the cuts, right? Practically, um, your flows are going to look like this, and your cuts are going to look like this, right? You find flows, and then uh, you f you can also find cuts, and you'll notice that the cuts are always bigger than every flow. Why is this true? If you consider sort of a general graph, we have S here and we have T here, right? And consider the few, the, like we have three edges here, right? So in a more practical sense, suppose this is like a river and there's exactly three bridges that cross this river, right? The maximum you, the maximum you can send from S to T has to be the capacities of the three bridges. But that's just the cut. Right? That is literally a partition of the graph because there's a bunch of things in here. It doesn't matter how, how complicated you can send things in here. No one cares. There's a bottleneck here of three bridges, right? So you can't send more than the capacity of the three bridges. Do we believe that? You convinced of that? Well, forget the bridges, forget the river. Just anywhere you can make a cut it is going to bound the capacity. So we get half of the maximum and cut theorem for free, uh, is that uh, we get that every flow possible, including the max flow, must be less than or equal to any cut. If you find a cut, then the number, then the possible flows must be less than that cut. Do you agree? Well, what is, if every flow is less than any cut, then consider the largest flow and the smallest cut. We get that the maximum of the, the max of the flows is then strictly is less than or equal not strictly is less than or equal to uh, the minimum cut the min of the cuts. Do we see how that follows? If you find a cut, the flows must be less than that cut. So whatever the maximum flow is has to be less than or equal to whatever the smallest cut that the smallest cut you can find. So we get half of a maximum min cut theorem for free just kind of looking at the picture. Do we agree with that's true? It's kind of important. We, we're certain of that, right? Um, great. So how do we prove that the max flow equals the minimum cut? Well, all we need to do is find one flow e that equals one cut. Notice here we found a flow of 7, and then we said the incoming to t was 7. So we know that the flow, when we said the incoming to t was 7, well, what that was was a cut. So to prove that the, to prove for a specific flow network that there is that the flow you have found is maximal, all you have to do is find a cut that equals the flow. Right? We're going to prove that there, for every flow that you can find, uh, there is going to be a cut uh, that is equal to the flow. Um, we're going to prove that in a roundabout way by giving the algorithm for max flow, and then we'll show how the algorithm for max flow also finds a cut that is equal. So by the fact that there is an equal cut to the flow that it outputs, that implies that the flow must be maximal, right? Practically. You won't, you won't have to do this algorithm if you can, like, uh, like if you were trying to cheat and do like a uh, pen and paper, you find one flow, you find one cut, you know that if the cut equals the flow, that, that has to be the maximum cut. That has to be the minimal, uh, f uh, that has to be the maximal flow and that has to be the minimal cut, right? The algorithm will guarantee that, will use that as a stopping condition, the Ford Fulkerson algorithm will, it'll implicitly uh, give the flow, um, and uh, it, it'll output a flow and then it'll stop. And then the outputted flow will also give a cut. Uh, and that cut will give the, it will, because the cut will equal the flow, we know the algorithm terminates on a maximal output. Any questions so far in the relationship between the max flow and the min cut? Any questions on max flow at all, on min cut? So far we understand just the basic definitions, no one's lost yet. The definition of a cut is, in a, a literal sense, a, a set partition. 
you, you, have, you partition the graph, the flow network, into, in, into two sets, L and R. Now, L and R are, have this property such that everything that's not in L must be in R, and that S must be in L and R, and T must be in R, right? The start must be in this designated set, the end must be in this designated set. This, the, the cut is computed for not the flow network, but the flow itself as the sum of the outgoing edges minus the sum of the incoming edges, where you're summing the flows, not the capacity, right? So for example, this is a cut in a graph. It's, it's a literal partition where you go from S to T and you have C1, C2, C3 as your capacity. Whatever those flows would be, uh, the maximum flow you can send over this cut would then be C1, C2, C3. So the, 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 the sum of the capacities that upper bounds the possible flows that could be sent over that, sent over that cut, right? Now, practically, when you've given a flow network, it's, if it's nice, it's on a sheet of paper, and you're not trying to implement a computer algorithm, you can just draw a dotted line, and you could just sum the outgoing edges, right? So quite literally, these are three edges that are going from this L, which contains S, to T, right? And if you're considering uh, any flow that has to go from S to T, it has to cross the edges of the cut. If you're going from S to T here, you have to go through these three bridges. You're forced to, right? There's not, and, and notice that's also guaranteed for us by the fact that L and R partition the graph. They're not just subsets of the graph. They are literally the partition, right? And this is the dotted line, so to speak. When you draw the dotted line and you sum the outgoing capacities, you know the flow can't be greater than that. You can't send more than three plus five plus four. Right? Similarly, you can't send more than five plus two. So we have all these cuts, and then you're allowed to do some weird cuts, right? You could do this as a cut. That's allowed to be a cut. Why would you do that? I don't even want to sum that up because there's going to be some incoming edges, but that's allowed. It's just any set partition where one contains S and the other contains T, right? Creativity, you may find some creative cuts in a graph that involve something like this. That one I don't think would be that creative because uh, there's an edge from T to S. If A is part of the cut, A is part of L in, the, in this dotted line cut, B is part of T. So that means there's an edge from T to S and then you would have to subtract that, right? If the, if the flow is not zero on that edge, you would have to subtract it, right? Yes. The smallest cut, so when you, su the cut is defined as the sum of the flows. You may suppose that the, f the, sum, of the sum of the flows is upper bounded by the sum of the outgoing capacities, right? So the minimal cut is what is the, s the fewest edges you, if you consider only a network of bridges, what is the fewest bombs you need to drop to disconnect S from T? You don't wanna drop more bombs than necessary. So it's like, how do I unplug these two, you know? And again, this is a, a great war, there's a great war analogy here because the supply lines are really important. You're, uh, you have to send all the trucks so those can carry the people and also the bombs. If you just blow up the roads, then they can't send the people and the bombs and then you win the war, something like that, right? Yeah. Twelve. Ah, the max flow would be six, but I claim then there is a more complicated cut because the max flow, I, we haven't proved it yet, we're, yet, we're about to, the max flow equals the min cut. Suppose you remo remove which edge, B to D or D to C? Let's suppose you remove one of them. It's okay to remove one. Let's suppose you remove B to D, then I claim there's a cut of six and then th there's a smaller cut. What's the cut? Consider A to D and S to C. Cut the graph right in the middle. That's two plus four is six. So that's a cut of six. The flow is then six. Cut equals flow means it's a maximal flow and a minimal cut. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it depends. Like, you, the reason it's defined as you sum the flows is because when you saturate the graph with the actual max flow, the, any edge that goes backwards through any cut has to hopefully have capacity zero. So like when you've practically solved the problem, if you're sending trucks backwards, bad things happen, right? 
So when you, in practice, when you, and you'll see this as we do the theorem, when you take the back edges, when you, let's say you find a maximal flow and you literally assign it into the graph, not just the number, but the actual edges which are saturated, the back edges are gonna be the ones with zero capacity. The forward edges are gonna be the ones that are saturated capacity. So practically, if it's a back edge for some cut, then you don't saturate it. Yes? Ah, but you sum the flows and not the capacity. The sum of the capacity upper bounds the flow, but that edge would have flow zero. The trucks must leave S. So if they are leaving S and somehow taking this back edge, they are exiting S, they're crossing the cut to get to the side of T, and then coming through this backwards edge of a million. So somehow the outgoing of the cut is already greater than the incoming. You won't have a negative flow. Does that make sense? Okay. More questions so far? Okay, the ford fulkerson algorithm is not really an algorithm. Uh, ford and Fulkerson just sort of derived a general way that they basically they proved the Maxwell min cut theorem and they sort of loosely defined uh, how you would construct it. So we're, sometimes in a, a theory class like this, like it's obvious how to implement the algorithm and sometimes it's not obvious how to implement the algorithm. Uh, this is one of those cases where the theoretical algorithm will make t should make total sense, but then like if you were to go to implement it, you may get kind of stuck. You're not sure exactly how, how it would work. Um, because certain things are undefined in the ford fulkerson algorithm, you would have to make those decisions uh, yourself. So for example, we're gonna choose paths through the graph but it's not defined through for forward and Fulkerson did not define how to choose paths. And if you choose paths using BFS, then it's called the Edmonds Karp algorithm. It's not called Ford Fulkerson anymore, right? Something like this. So, you know, understand that like uh, when you implement this, you may have to, uh, a half second of, uh, of to pause. Um, basically what we're gonna do is we're going to, um, The ford fulkerson algorithm basically is a greedy algorithm that maintains decisions made so that you can undo mistakes, right? So like if you consider the, the flow network and you try to solve it in a greedy fashion, you might run into some issues because you may need to send one truck backwards and then send another one forward or something like this, right? But then that may require only sending n minus one trucks some through some previous edge instead of n. Something like this, right? So you have room for that one truck. So a greedy algorithm is not exactly going to work, but the ford fulkerson algorithm is basically a greedy algorithm that maintains decisions made so that you can undo the decisions through future greedy decisions, right? A future greedy decision may involve undoing a previously done greedy decision. That's basically all the ford fulkerson algorithm does. So if you have uh, some graph G and you have uh, an edge like this with some flow uh, and some capacity, the ford fulkerson maintains a copy of the graph called the residual. The residual graph basically contains a bunch of metadata of the decisions you made in the graph. So what it's going to do is it's going to uh, create two edges, one forward and one backwards, where the backwards edge is the f is uh, C minus F, excuse me, the backwards edge, uh, the backwards edge will contain uh, the flow and the forwards edge will contain the remaining capacity, right? So if the flow equals the capacity, suppose in the graph, this edge is saturated. This means there's, there's two lanes, you're sending two cars, right? There's, this flow is, this is a full edge, right? If that's true, C minus F is what? Zero, if C, that means C equals F, so C minus F is zero. So there's a forward edge of capacity zero, which means you can't take it. An, an edge of zero means you don't take it. Um, but then there's a backwards edge of F. So basically, we're gonna compute the flows and then we're gonna update the residual graph. And as we update the residual graph, you'll notice that the edges start flipping backwards. And as the edges start flipping backwards in the residual graph, the more edges that flip backwards, the more disconnected S becomes from T. And eventually you flip enough edges backwards 
uh, your S will be disconnected from T. Now the edges that you'll flip backwards are going to exactly be uh, where your cut is, it turns out, because that's where the flow is saturated along the cut. And that's why the max flow will equal the mid cut. We'll do an example to make that explicit. But the residual graph is, uh, the flows are computed over the residual graph and then updated. Right? The Ford Fulkerson algorithm basically works as follows. Um, You take as input the, the, the graph, and you want to compute the max flow and the min cut. And we're going to initialize uh, uh, residual GF as G. Uh, flow is going to be initialized to 0. Uh, and while the residual graph contains uh, an ST path. Um, find path and its bottleneck B. Augment uh, GF. Um, by subtracting path uh, from GF of B with B. Add reverse edges to a GF of uh, B. And then you're going to augment the flow number as well, and then you will just return the flow. So again, very high level algorithm. Given a description like this, you should not be able to implement it. Uh, lots of decisions are made. You're going to find, while GF contains an ST path, while there's still a path from S to T, you're going to uh, take that path, Find the bottleneck of the path. The bottleneck of the path is the minimum number of edges on the path, is the minimum, uh, the minimum weight of that edge on the, on the path. Now in a residual graph, it doesn't just contain the flow capacity. Recall it contains forward edges of the capacity minus flow. Capacity minus flow is the remaining capacity of that edge where it has flow incoming from something else. So while it still contains an ST path, some of those edges may be C minus F edges. So that's the remaining flow on that edge in the actual graph. You, you saturate that by the bottleneck. You sum over the, the rest of the path with those, and then you update the edges to be F backwards and C minus F forwards, right? As you do so, S and T will be becoming more disconnected. And then when there's no more ST paths, then you simply stop. And you, the residual graph that's outputted will contain both the max flow and the minimum cut. We'll do an example to make that very clear. But any questions so far? Uh, how do you find an ST path? Ford and Fulkerson didn't define it, but Edmonds and Karp did. They said you use BFS to find the path, right? Um, high level idea, uh, this algorithm terminates when there's no ST path, and there's exactly no ST path when the cut found implicitly why the algorithm is also minimal. Yes? Basically. You, you, it says while GF contains an ST path, what you do is you run BFS. If there's an ST path, then you take that ST path, and then you compute with that. Right. Uh, exactly. Now, uh, the reason you, you can't do all the BFS at the beginning, because you're going to update the graph. You're going to saturate certain edges. You're going to, the bottlenecks are going to be computed in the graph, and the edges on the graph will change. 
So you can't do all the BSFS at the beginning and then find the path. In fact, some graph examples have it in the case, and maybe the one I think we'll do today has an example, where a path closes, another, another path comes around and opens that path back up, and then another path is found to close the path again. Something like this happens, because the edges will keep flipping. It, the reason that this algorithm works over a greedy algorithm is that the information of previously chosen ST paths that, have satur that you've saturated, the previous flow decisions you've made, have been stored in the graph. That information cont is contained in the graph. And basically, by choosing another path, it allows you to undo a previous path, right? If you just did a greedy algorithm, you're forced into the decisions you've made, and you're locked in, right? You can't undo a decision. But this formulation of it basically allows the fact that, like, a future greedy decision can implicitly undo previous greedy decisions. And that's the reason it works. It's not just straight gr greedy, but it's kind of greedy with a cute little trick. And why does this also return a min cut? We, it's not even obvious that this returns a min cut. I mean, where's the min cut? But as we, when, we do the out, when we do the example in just a second, uh, there will be a minimum cut. Any questions uh, just on the high, very high level implementation? Yeah. So like, if you have a path of like, uh, like five capacity, two capacity, three capacity, the bottleneck is two, right? The, you'll, you'll choose a path and not like a, it's not going to be diverse or anything. It's going to be like path. And it's just going to be a straight line sequence of edges. The bottleneck would be the minimum edge on that path. It's the minimum you could send over that uh, flow. I mean, over that specific path, right? Question, more questions on just the high level forward Fulkerson. Man, see, I didn't implement it on purpose, so I don't have to answer that question. So. The answer is, actually, it's very complicated because the, the capacities can contain not integers, but real numbers. There exists uh, an example in the CLRS book, and by the way, the CLRS book has a great treatment of this. Instead of just implementing it, like the DPV book just says this is a corollary of linear programming. It doesn't address it as great as it should. CLRS contains a very detailed chapter. They have a, they have a graph with five edges, I think, or six edges, wh whose time complexity is like a, a billion or something because the algorithm has to keep undoing itself and it, it does it 0.01 at a time, something like this. And it's a function of the number of bits an edge, a, a real numbered edge must contain, right? Because notice that we're gonna put C minus F there. So what if C was like 9999999 and then F was 0 0.01, right? How many times would you have to, to subtract a flow of 0 0.01 from 9999 to get it to be zero? A lot of steps, it turns out. And then you can actually modify the Ford Fulkerson algorithm, if you assume integer numbers, it's, it's, it's much more efficient. But like the actual Ford Fulkerson algorithm, and that's a, that's a, you have to do, always do worst case analysis. That's not a practical, uh, you'll never have that in the real world, but that is really, really bad. It's like really, really bad runtime, right? Um, high level idea, we don't have to worry about the time. It's just, it's just the fact that it works at all, the fact that Optimality is, is, what, is, what, is what's guaranteed, right? The flow is maximal. We don't have to just hope it's maximal, but it is maximal, right? That, that'll come from the max flow min cut theorem. The max flow min cut theorem being true will guarantee the stopping condition uh, is correct and that this outputs a maximum flow. More questions on this before we get to the, we'll just do the example of the Edmonds carp, uh, excuse me, of the Fort Fulkerson. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just take this graph and I'm going to, um, not have to redraw it. I'm just going to take this graph and I'm going to uh, run the Ford Fulkerson algorithm on this graph. So the first step of the Ford Fulkerson graph is initialize the residual graph as the graph. Oh, yes. So we begin with, uh, let me put the capacities back on there, 3, 10, 5, 4, 1, 2, 1, 1, 5, 5, 2, okay? Now, Ford Fulkerson again does not specify how paths are chosen, 
So I'm going to choose the paths uh, for us. Let's choose as a first path and follow along to make sure I'm not making any mistakes. You know, uh, tiny little arrows may go missing. I'm going to choose first the path S A D C E T. Okay. So I'm going to go S A D C E T. Okay. What is the uh, bottleneck of that path? S A is two. D S A D C. That's one. Five. Five, so the bottleneck of that path is one. Do you agree? So what I'm going to do is augment the graph with the bottleneck one. I'm going to replace this with a, with a two, with C minus F, and then I'm going to add a back edge of capacity one. So I'm going to do that for every, every edge along the path. And I'm going to cross it out instead of erasing it, just so uh, you can see as the, as the flow updates. This is going to have a back edge of one. Importantly, notice that C minus F plus F is C. So this had capacity 2, but now there's two edges, one going forward, one going backwards of 1 plus 1. Same thing here. This had capacity 3, now it's got a forward edge of 2 and a backwards edge of 3. The backwards edge is the things you've already sent. The forward edge is what is left that you can send, right? Uh, this edge is going to have capacity 0, so it basically doesn't exist. And this, uh, there's a forward edge here of capacity 1. You can think that a forward edge of capacity 0 means nothing can be sent there. You can even delete that edge, practically. Um, and again, 1 plus 0 is uh, 0. We're going to send 4 here, and then backwards we're going to send 1. And then uh, we're going to go ET, so this is going to be 4. And then there's going to be a uh, backwards edge of capacity 1. Do we agree? We've, this is now a residual graph. It's not the original graph. Okay? This is not the same flow network at all. It's simply the metadata of the graph plus a chosen flow. So we've sent one unit down this path. Do you agree? Notice as we do this, S and T are going to become more and more disconnected because a lot of the edges are going to start flipping backwards. Right? We flipped one edge backwards already from C to D. So you can no longer go from D to C. That path has been, if you think about it, there was a bridge from D to C. We've blown up that bridge. There's now a backwards bridge, right? Now consider the next path. Um, we're going to do S uh, A D E T. And again, I'm choosing the paths for you, but if you were to implement this, you would have to choose those paths through some algorithm. Right? BFS is a, is, a, is a sane choice, right? So I'm going to go S to A to D. And then I'm going to go down this bridge. I'm going to skip C. I'm going to go down D S A D E T. Right? What is the bottleneck of S A D E T? One. So I'm going to update this two to be a uh, one, and I'm going to update this one to be a two. Right? I'm going to update this one to be a zero because this edge is now saturated. I'm going to do this one to be a two. Right? I'm going to update this 1 to be a 0, and I'm going to have a backwards edge of 1. And then I'm going to update this uh, 4 to be a 3, and then this 1 to be a 2. Follow along, make sure I didn't make any mistakes. Notice now that A and D are disconnected, right? We sent two different paths from S-A-D-C-E-T and S-A-D-E-T, and we put two trucks on the to with road from A to D. So any paths that remain cannot go above. They cannot go from A to D because there's only a backwards edge. So as we keep adding flows like this, S is going to be more and more disconnected from T. As the edges keep flipping backwards, we're, it's over, right? Let's do the next path. Let's do S, C, E, T. Get. We're going to go S. We're going to go down. Because we can't, we, there's no point going through A anymore. We're out of stuff to go through A. So we'll go S to C, then to E to T. Okay. What is the bottleneck of S C E T? Three. Yeah. There's a forward edge here of three. Now again, this is not the actual capacity of that edge. It's three. It's the remaining capacity because we already sent two trucks that on that edge. So five lanes, two trucks means three left. Well, there's the three. So we'll send th we'll send three trucks there. Uh, the bottleneck is 3. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, change this 4 to a, th a 1. And then we'll have a backwards edge of 3. We'll change um, 
this 4 to a 1 and this 1 to a 4. We'll change this uh, 3 to a 0 and this 2 to a 5. So notice now E is disconnected from T, right? Uh, what path is remaining? We have, we still, the, 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 there's a while, there's an ST path. So there's still ST paths in here. You can go through B. Can you go through B? Well, A is disconnected from D, so you can't really do anything in there. Can you go to, yeah, there's still a path here. Uh, S to C to D to T. SC, what about S C E D T? We're going to go S C E D T. Now, if you take S C D E D T, you're going to go. What is the bottleneck of S C E D T? One. The bottleneck here, S C E D T, is going to be this one. So you're going to go. This one is going to become a zero. This three is going to become a four. Uh, this. 1 is going to become a 0. This 4 is going to become a 5. This 1 is going to become a 0. And this 0 is going to become a 1. So see how that edge was like flipped, flipped? It, the channel opened forward, and then it opened backwards, and it opened forward again. Right? We undid. A f by setting this specific edge from 1 to 0 to 1, we undid a flow that we previously did. That's how the four Fulkerson algorithm works. We chose flows in a greedy manner, but we're like, oh, well, we can, if we undo that, then we can send something else. That's basically the decision it made. We send that to a 1. We change that 0 to a 1, and we change this 1 to a 0. So now this is a backwards edge. And now this edge is going to be of 1, but then there's going to be a backwards edge here of 1. OK? Now, there's one more path in this graph. What is it? Let's see if we can find it. S to B to D to T, and its capacity is going to be 1. S, B, D, T. Its capacity is going to be 1. So this is going to be uh, 5 is going to become a 1. Wait. 4. Thank you. Uh, there's going to be a backwards edge of 1. 1 is going to become a 0, and there's going to be a backwards edge of 1. S, B, D, T, there's a forward edge of 1, which is going to become 0, and this backward edge will become saturated with 2. Um, and that's it, it looks like. Now, are there any more S to T paths? No, we can't find any, so we stop. We have the residual graph as the output. Let's extract the maximum flow, and let's also extract the minimum cut. Okay? Normally, when you would do this, you would compute what the flow is by itself. But the flow is not, I didn't want to just say flow plus plus, because when you compute a flow, it, undo, un, it, it undoes other flows. So it's not always flow plus plus. So then given the residual graph, we can count the flow in the graph, right? What is the, uh, let me redraw the graph without backwards edges. Oh, God. Right, so there's no edge from uh, D to T, but there is a backwards edge of capacity 2. And again, this is not the graph, this is the residual graph. There is no forward edge from E to T, but there is a backwards edge of 5. C to E has no forward edge, but it does have a backwards edge of 5. Uh, C to uh, D has a forward edge of 1. And C, D to E has a down edge of 1. And uh, S to C has no forward edge, but a back edge of 4. Uh, S to B has a forward edge of 4 and a back edge of 1. S to A has a forward edge of 1 and a back edge of 2. And uh, a to D and then B to D are left. A to D has no forward edge but a back edge of 2. And uh, S to S B to D has a 
only a back edge of one. Okay. So this is the output residual graph. If you notice, given C minus F and F as the edges, we can recompute what the actual flow is. So notice that uh, there's two and a seven, there's two and a five outgoing from T. So we know that the flow here is seven. Do we agree? Any edge that's going straight backwards is saturated. Uh, if uh, f is equal to c, then we only have a backwards edge of uh, c and a forward edge of zero, right? So anywhere there's a backwards edge, you know that that path is saturated. So we can see here where the cut is. If you take the cut and it's full of backwards edges, then you know that that's the minimal cut. Yeah. Saturated means c equals f. There's no leftover capacity. It's full. The flow is 7 here because you can see that this has a cut here of 2 and 5. By there's a backwards edge of 2, that means that this has capacity equal to the flow. This has capacity equal to the flow because there's no forward edge. So we know that this had a f in the original graph, not in the residual graph. Yes? No, for any cut. Uh, for this specific example, it looks like there's a, a flow here. But you take the cut and you, you look at the ones that have, uh, there's other cuts here that all the edges are going from T to S that are backwards. A to, you cut here, it's going to be 2 plus 1 plus 4, which is 7. All those edges are going backwards. Now, what does that mean? The edges going forwards being 0 means that that edge is saturated. So the not only does the Ford Fulkerson algorithm give you a maximum flow, but it also gives you the minimal cuts. Because wherever the uh, edges are saturated is a disconnect from S to T, right? Here's sort of how we can prove it. Suppose that uh, the maximum flow was not maximal. Suppose the flow was max not maximal. If the flow was not maximal, then there is more things you can send, right? So in uh, G of F, there exists an ST path. But uh, Ford Fulkerson terminated uh, because no more ST paths. If the flow was not maximal, there must exist an ST path with some bottleneck B. And F plus B would be a greater flow. But if that were to be true, then the Ford Fulkerson algorithm would not have terminated. The termination condition of the Ford Fulkerson algorithm is exactly uh, when the cut found is minimal. Do we agree? Do we see like the insight here, the way it does, the, uh, it returns the maximal flow? Why does it all return the minimal cut is because the uh, the minimal cut is going to be a saturated cut, right? We said that the, the sum of the uh, outgoing edges of a cut, the flow is going to be equal. The minimal flow is going to be equal to the the minimal cut is going to be equal to the maximal flow, right? So if you think about it, if S is disconnected from T, if you call explore, if you call BFS or DFS from S, T should be disconnected from it. You will find the actual cut. So call explore from S to T, and that'll give you the cut itself, right? So let's call explore on S. What do you reach? You can go to A, you can go to B, and that's it. So a, a, S to A to B is the cut. You make one quick DFS or BFS call. You Everything that's reachable from, a, from S is therefore L. So explore of S is equal to L. And then R, again, is equal to V minus L. So the edges that cross from the explored called of S to everything else is going to be the cut. That's, that is exactly the cut, right? If it wasn't the cut, if there was something reachable, then the flow wouldn't have been maximal, right? 
So the, the max flow found is equal to the minimum cut. The forward focus on algorithm gives you the max flow, and then it gives you the max flow by ensuring that there is no smaller cut. That's the max flow must equal the minimum cut. This is a flow that is maximal, and it's also a cut that's minimal, right? We, we argued previously that, every, that the, max of, the max of the flows was uh, less than or equal to the min of the cuts. And to prove that the max flow equals the min cut, you just need to find one flow that equals one cut. If that's true, then the max flow does equal the min cut. It is not less than or equal to, right? And that's true because this is a flow. These edges are saturated, so the flow is exactly that. But then that's also the cut in the graph. So the cut equals the flow. QED, max flow, min cut, they're improved. Any questions? Yeah. Sorry, what? Ah, for example, there's a forward edge between S and B. That means the flow, but the, the, the edge in the original graph, not the uh, residual graph, the original graph from S to B is not fully saturated. If there's a forward edge of S to B, that means you could, you could send four more trucks to B, but then you couldn't send them anywhere else. So whatever you can explore from S is the things that are not fully saturated, and then the cut of explore of S to everything else is going to be the edges that are saturated. The bottleneck, the total bottleneck from S to T is going to be explorer of S. It's going to be where you, that's where you draw the line. You don't draw the line here or here. It doesn't matter how big the highways are. It, this is the big highway. You can think of this picture if you want. Like you, let's say you have a really wide highway and then suddenly you have a really narrow thing and then you have a really wide highway again. Where is that, where's the smallest bottleneck of the entire graph? That's the minimum cut. And unfortunately, it's not a nice picture like this, but it, because the graph is complicated, there's backwards edges and roundabouts and so on. All right, any more questions on uh, this max flow min cut theorem? I have one more quick example uh, for you uh, of an application of the max flow min cut theorem. And this is a classic example called baseball elimination, but it works for any sport. So suppose it's like the end of the season and uh, you know your team has some number of game left, some number, some number of games left, and it's like uh, you're coping, you're trying to see if you can win. And let's say you have uh, the following leaderboard with the number of games left. Let's see where did I put it? Okay, so let's say you have team uh, one, two, three, and you have some more teams. We're just looking at the top of the leaderboard. Let's say these teams have wins. Let's say team one has 90 wins left, and then there's some number of games to play. And they have, let's say, two games left. Let's say team two has 87 games to play, and they have uh, three games left. And let's say team three has like 80 games left to play, and they have two games left, right? Something like this. Um, you may, uh, you know, at the end of the season, you've played this many games, you have this many wins, you have this many games left, whatever. Uh, you're concerned with the fact, like, can, does my team already have locked in first place? Do I have to worry about anyone else? And so a trivial thing to do is to take the wins plus games left and determine the max score you could earn, right? Let's uh, notice that 90 plus 2 is greater than 87 plus 3, right? So let's say team 2 wins all its games and team 1 wins all its games. Well, team 2, team 1 is going to be in first place unconditionally, right? If they both win all their games, there's no way team 2 can surpass team 1. So you would say, oh, team 2, if, as long as they win both games without even worrying about, excuse me, team 1, as long as they win both games without worrying about team 2, will uh, win, undisputably, right? But there's a problem with that. Uh, what's the problem with that? That logic doesn't work, it's, yeah? Well, suppose they do win all their games. There is a slight, 
Well, even if they do win all their games, they will win first place unconditionally. But there's a slight hiccup in that analysis that may not be clear from this specific example. You could even say, you know, uh, you could say, well, we could even lose one game as long as team, uh, the second team also loses all their games. Suppose you assume that team two loses all their games and team one loses uh, both their games. We still win, right? There is a, a slight problem with that. Yeah. Exactly. So team, it's not necessarily true that the wins of your team is independent of the wins of the other team because if the, it, it doesn't specify which games they're being played. So every win that team two makes, a, team two may play team one. So even if, if team one wins all three of their games and one of those games is against team one, that implies that team one loses a game. So the highest score team one could get then is 91. And these guys will make 90. Actually, they're not winning. Suppose two of the games are there, right? These guys win two games means these guys lose two games. See what I'm saying? Every win is someone else's loss. And that's kind of something that's lost in, um, you know, this is the, the kind of things people who do sports betting don't really think about. They, they're, they're just, they know how to add numbers, but they don't have a, a more complicated understanding of any, any of the problem. We can solve this problem using flows. Because flow conserves this property for us. It's going to have the fact that uh, a game is won or lost, but it can only go to one of, the, one of the two people. So what we can do is create a flow network that models the number of wins that a game has left. Um, whether or not your team has a path to unconditional victory. Let's see if I have the example. So you're going to have a start node S, and you're going to have an end node T, and you're going to create uh, a set of intermediary nodes of two layers here, 1, 2, 1, 3. Uh, let's do 1, 4. And let's just say down here you have 3, 4. These are nodes representing uh, the number of games played against team 1 and team 2 left, OK? Uh, and then you're going to have arrows here with G, uh, 1, 2, uh, G, 1, 3. Uh, G one comma four. Uh, G three comma four. Something like this, right? Then you have a second layer here of one, two, three, four. Let's just suppose it's of size two. Now, importantly here, if G one two is going to be the number of games, it's a capacity of this edge. It's the number of games left between team one and team two. Okay. Every game that's won. Between team one and team two is zero sum. Every game, every uh, between every game between team one and team two, there's a winner and a loser. Either team one wins or team two wins, right? If G one two is the number of games that team one and team two play, the outgoing edges of one two must be equal to G T one plus T two. So what we're actually going to do here is draw two arrows to one and two, and these are going to correspond to the number of wins. So this is going to be T1 over infinity and T2 over infinity. Notice by flow conservation, G12 must equal to T1 plus T2. So every game that goes into the 1, 2 node has to come out of the 1, 2 node, but it can only go to one of the two, right? Now we want to determine if our specific team has a path to victory. So let me finish drawing this. We'll do a node like that and like that and like that. Something like that, right? Uh, you make uh, just two layers in your flow network, and then you're going to send the capacity here of, let's say, your team X. Let's say the team you're concerned with is team X. You want to determine if someone can have capacity greater than you, if someone has can score more wins than you. So what you're going to do is just set the flow edges to determine that this, net, this, this flow network should have a flow only if someone can score more wins than you. You haven't locked in the victory. So what it'll be is it'll be the number of wins of team X plus the remaining games of Team X minus the wins of Team 1. Right? Now that's going to be the capacity of that edge. Right? The number of incoming 
to the second layer, we have one, two, three, four. The number of incoming flow, not necessarily capacity, but the number of incoming flow to this node one is the number of games that team one will win. And if the flow that, out, that incomes to one is also gonna be outgoing to the here, if that number is a greater than this, then we know that they have a path to victory. Team one has a path to victory over you, team X, right? The number of incoming edges is the number of games won. The sum of the capacity that is incoming here is the number of possible games that team one can win. But notice that this probably models the issue that we had previously by just by, by summing the wins and the remaining games, right? If you're left with, uh, because a team one and team two can't both win all their games if they play games against each other. One of them has to be a winner, the one of them has to be a loser. And this, by flow conservation, models that perfectly. Any questions on this example? So this, this network has a flow if and only if that team has a path to victory over you. So you can use max flow to determine if uh, someone is gonna win. You didn't, then you just run four fold percent on this if there's a flow at all. Rather than a max flow, if there's a flow at all, you can determine how much they're gonna win over you. But if this graph has a flow at all, then they, uh, that's how you solve the problem. Any questions on this example, the baseball elimination? We'll see next time that the max, this is a special case of the max flow min cut uh, problem, but actually you can generalize max flow min cut to anything with a system of linear inequalities called linear programming. We'll talk about that next time. All right, see you guys on Thursday. <laughs>